My name is Trevor Getz, and I'm a professor of African history at San Francisco State University. I'm here at Cape Coast Castle in Ghana, in West Africa. You know, 25 years ago, when I first became interested in African history, my high school world history textbook had very little to say about Ghana. It was as if there was no information about the place, but in fact, we know an awful lot about this country, and it's Ghanaian historians who help us to understand it and its place in world history. I'm here to talk to some of those historians about the Atlantic slaving system. I want to understand what Ghana was like before the Atlantic slave trade and how the Atlantic slave trade, which ripped millions of people from their homes and left devastation in its wake, changed this country and the lasting legacy that it has. So I'm here with Ato Oshun, the regional director for the Ghana Museums and Monuments Board. Yeah. And where are we? Currently, you are at Cape Coast Castle. Before Europeans arrived in this region, in general, what kind of political structures were there? Well, you know, before they came, we have the chiefs working together with the elders of states. They will be today like the president and the cabinet ministers running the system. And we are the heads of the various family units. We call them Ibusia. They are those together with the chief running the, the political system of the various places. So you have an executive, the chiefs, and then you have a legislative, if you will, which is the elders. Of course. What was the economic system like here? Were people trading? Was there commerce? Uh, were people growing things? Was there industry? If I, we, we would have the, the farming, growing things. We have the commerce. And we have fishing also. So a pretty sophisticated commercial system, stable states with an executive and a legislative branch. And then we have the arrival of Europeans and we have the Atlantic slave trade. When did the Atlantic slave trade begin here? You would talk about the fact that when the Portuguese came over here, they came along with it. But then when you talk of the Cape Coast Castle, you talk about when the English took over, actually. So that would run about 1660, 65, thereabouts. At that point, is it involved in the slave trade? Oh yes, at that time they had already started. And so what would happen? Would British and other European ships come up here to purchase people? Two different occasions would happen. When the merchants would come to buy and when the castle would supply their colonies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there were actually dungeons built into this place right from the beginning. Absolutely. We have two separate dungeons. We have the male's dungeon and the female's dungeons. We, total, we could talk about uh, 1,300, the minimum. People. People. At one minimum. time. At one time, yes. And in the male's dungeons, we have five compartments making up the whole dungeon. And every compartment had 200 people at a time. It is sad to see the dungeon because, you know, unlike other places where they were given containers where they could defecate into them, here in Cape Coast Castle, they created sort of canals in the dungeon that they could do it into them. And whenever it rained, the rain will wash these away. Yeah. I mean, these must be terrible, terrible conditions, unimaginable. Unimaginable. But here's what really shocks me. Yeah. We are sitting above the dungeons, essentially. The British officers were living above this all the time. Can you, I mean, it's unimaginable. So for it to be worth it, it must have made a lot of money for them. Of course. Yeah. Of course. This was very profitable for that the European it. companies involved and mm -hmm. such. How did the Atlantic slave trade uh, transform the economic system here? Well, so now human beings have become commodities. Mm. So those who would dig for gold are now going to capture people. Those who would spend time farming are being captured. So it changed the whole dynamics. We would start experiencing farming from this end because people would start moving deep into the forest, running away from the radar of these wicked people. Yes, the economics changed. Wow, so, okay, so it sounds like three things you're saying is, first of all, people are being taken away so they don't work. Second, people who would normally be working on productive things like digging for gold or growing things are turning to slave trading because they have to in order to survive. Right. 
And thirdly, people can't live where they would normally live. They have of to go course. into the forest. They have to keep moving. This is a huge yes. transformation. So leave yeah. everything you've done behind because yeah. you don't want to be captured. It was really a time of insecurity. Yeah. People have to move with security guards and so on, because you dare not move alone. You'd always go in bands because you were not sure what would happen on the way. It also affected the legal system in terms of the court system, because where there were fines for various offenses, some kings would decide that, no, we are not going to ask you to pay any fine. Rather go and become a slave somewhere. I had the case of the king of Commander in the 1700s who the brother did something he didn't like. And instead of asking the brother pay a fine, he asked the brother to be enslaved across the Atlantic. Not only the brother, but the wife and the children as well, you know. And then also in some areas, like the Akwemu area, people resorted to kidnapping a lot, Akwemu, Akwemu. And that also affected the traditional system because kidnapping was not a way of life in Ghana. So I've been talking to people mostly along the coast about slavery and the Atlantic slaving system. And I'm very interested to get a view from further in the interior, from this region, which you are an expert in, and further to the north. Well, <laughs> it affected the Middle Belt directly and indirectly. Directly in the sense that they wanted European goods such as guns, gunpowder, fabrics, and so on. And they had to deliver in return whatever the Europeans wanted at a particular time. So initially, it was mainly gold and elephant tusk or ivory. And they were so positioned that they could deliver these commodities. And then over time, as uh, the transatlantic slave trade intensified and the commodities that were required in exchange for European goods desired by the Asante and people in the Middle Belt generally was human beings because of the plantation agriculture that was going on in the New World. Most of the slaves that were taken out of Asante, for example, did not necessarily originate from this region. They had to look up north for them. What was the impact of the Atlantic slave trade in the north? Uh, to the north, I'll say it was more devastating in the sense that, if you remember, I said most of the slaves that were sent from the Middle Belt did not originate from here. They came from the north either as captives or they were brought in as tributes because parts of the north had been conquered by Asante and as subjects of Asante, they had to pay homage and tribute to Asante. And this caused people in the north to war amongst themselves. And also some of them found the opportunity to trade. So if they were able to attack weaker neighbors, they will be able to acquire slaves, sell off, and get some money out of that. What do you think was the impact on that region of the removal of so many hundreds of thousands or even millions of people? First of all, I would say insecurity, because one was not too certain when there will be a raid. And there are so many stories about villages that were attacked, raided, and people taken away, and 
though some of them who found their way to the South and became integrated in Southern societies, you know, tell of how they came to be in the South. So you can tell from them that there was a lot of insecurity. And definitely, if people are worried, trying to protect themselves, it's going to also hinder their major source of economic activity, which was agriculture. So I'll say that in the North, it must have had more devastating effect. What do you think have been the long-term impacts of the Atlantic slave trade on Ghanaian society? Now people hedge about talking about their roles in the transatlantic slave trade. It takes a lot of effort before people will actually open up to talk about it. Talking to people who have lost family. You know, very often uh, we just think about those who were sent away. But we do not think about those who were left behind because those who were sent out belonged to families. They had parents, they had siblings, some of them had children and so on. And their memories of those who lost loved ones to the trade. So that is uh, very often it's hidden. It doesn't come out in the open. So we're actually talking about multi-generational trauma. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. incredible. Let me make it very simple. One simple thing it did was to take away our independence and bring in dependency. So that, you know, we are digging for gold ourselves. Now when we get the gold, we have to bring you the gold dust to bring us the trinkets. Now we're not able to have the opportunity to develop the system we're already having. Let me ask you, how did you first learn about the impact of the Atlantic slave trade here? In my growing stages, I never had the opportunity to visit the dungeons mm. that much. I could see the castle pass by. But when I grew up a little bit, that was when I entered for the first time. And I had then grown, so I was like, that was why I said to you that I was sitting in the dungeons crying every morning for about a week or two, because one, I was surprised that it did happen. So I was again surprised that even though I was born around the castle, never had the opportunity to, to visit it. So then it was very difficult to take. So can you tell me what the door of no return is? You know, the very last point the African exited from the castles to the ships to be taken away. That very last point of the exit is what is termed door of no return. Because knowing that you will never come back in to Africa again. What do you think about the fact that tourists come here to see this place that is really a place of enormous suffering? Yeah. I think that those who are coming are here to learn so that we don't repeat the same mistakes. So it doesn't serve just as a tourist center, but a kind of educational mm. center sort of, so that everybody will learn from it and will make the world a better place than it is today. Between about the 1440s and the 1880s, over a million Ghanaians were ripped from their homes and kidnapped into the Atlantic slave trade. Multiply that by more than 10 to understand the scale over the entire continent of Africa. We know that this must have had a deep and dramatic impact on Ghanaian society. We can think about the psychological trauma it must have caused, the social breakdowns, the economic dislocation, and the political decline. We don't really know about the impact of the Atlantic slave trade. Enslaved people don't leave behind a lot of records, and a lot of people today in different parts of the world don't want to talk about that era. As a result, when we get Ghanaian historians together, we see some disagreement over the precise details of the Atlantic slave trade and its impact. But we also see a broad recognition that the results were deep and they were lasting, that they were widespread and that they still haven't gone away today and that we need to understand the scale of the impact of the slave trade in Africa if we are to understand the patterns of world history themselves.